Julian, a very well welcome to the Swiss Spinner Show. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks. For me as well. You're the co-founder and CEO at Autumn Fit, a gym which provides innovative high-intensity training in just six minutes. You are just so much more than just a regular gym or anything. We're going to talk about all of that because I, I will probably call it the Autumn Experience because I also train there myself. Before we do talk about Autumn, we want to focus on your personal background. You study economics, but before you did so, you were also part of Germany's National Sailing Squad. And that's also where you first heard about the HIT training. Tell us a bit more about that. Why was that relevant? What was your first touching point there? Yeah, so um, to in sailing, if you want to be competitive, you have to have a, a certain weight. Um, for, for, the, for the class that I ended up in, it was around uh, 98 to 102 kilos. Otherwise, uh, in heavy winds, you, you would not be competitive. And, and so um, when I um, was selected to the sea squad, which is already a, a national level squad, um, in this class, um, they told me, look, you are weighing 88 kilos at the moment, you have to bulk up. And so strength training became a regular part of the regime and in the beginning we had a coach that uh, now in hindsight I know did not know so much about how really muscle grows. He mm -hmm. was training us too much so we, we would do three times a week we would do one hour like the thing that everybody knows about like three yeah. times a week one hour of, of strength training then something will happen and and it's it's basically not true and, and we could feel it additionally to the workload of, of doing the, the training on the water uh, my training partner actually went into a severe burnout, like a physical burnout, because of so much training and, and, and we were actually getting fat, we were not becoming muscular and it, it, it did clearly not work. And, and so we decided to, to uh, get a private coach mm -hmm. uh, that had a really good track record in, in, in the sailing uh, scene for bringing people and athletes to, to the games. And, and so we, um, we met with him and he told us, right out of the start, uh, out of the start uh, forget everything you know about strength training, forget everything about uh, conditioning or, or um, endurance training, actually high intensity style workouts work wonders. And, and so that was my starting point and I, I was sucked into this whole, um, like, um, into this whole um, knowledge around high intensity training and, 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 and and in many ways, it kind of resonates me because I'm a, I'm a contrarian, an extreme contrarian. I, I love uh, asking like fundamental questions, which we will talk about later also when we talk about our room. And uh, so I had a, a natural affinity to this, to this against the mainstream way of thinking about physical fitness and, and high intensity training is the, is the representation of that in strength training. What actually made you believe that coach? Because it could have also just been another guru telling you yeah. this is the new holy grail, but then you would have also eventually burned out or it didn't work. What made you believe him? Did you see fast results? Yeah, or? Uh, excellent question. It was really fast results. So uh, body composition would change from being a bit fat to really starting to see muscle gain actually um, being also uh, when we in the, in the standing squat or in in any other squad you do these seven kilometer run tests right and so there were people in in both classes where you only have 60 or 70 kilo as a competitive weight mm -hmm. and i was with 102 kilo i was running as fast as these guys well, and i was crazy. like okay this this is clearly working high intensity style, uh, style workouts clearly really uh put your put your physique to the next level uh, when it comes to muscle and also endurance and yeah. yeah that was kind of a game changer for me and it was really um i could see it in in my body and in my performance and mm -hmm. then afterwards kind of after the fact uh i really dove deep into the science and into the into the uh, literature that's out there um namely body by science by dr doug mcguff and um, um the muscle revolution by dr marco toigo here from from ETH and, and both come basically to the same conclusion uh, and it's it's that this stuff really works. You know, from the outside perspective, if you, if you speak about burnout, then you would probably think high intensity if you practice that sort of training, that cannot be sustainable. Yeah. So how do you balance that to yeah. avoid a burnout or overtraining as you yeah. did in the past? Yeah, I mean, 
if you would do a high intensity style workout every day, right. kind of think about a, a CrossFit style workout with, with the workout of the day or uh, any other um, sport where you really practice super hard every day, you really run into the into the danger zone of, of burnout because actually um, many people think that, that the workout itself is the most important part. Most important part. It, 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 it plays a big role, but uh, actually the recovery and enough time for your body to recover is, is even more important than doing a great workout. Um, they should they should always come together and and our our biology is actually set up the way it was 10,000 years ago and and so um, when you do a high intensity strength training workout or a high intensity sprint workout or or anything that puts your body of above this intensity threshold of, of really stress severe stress mm -hmm. which comes with a, a good adaptive response if you give it the time to to recover um, is a stress in the end and and if you if you stress your yourself too much all the time you will run into a burnout and right. you know, our, our body is actually designed to uh, have have extremely uh, brief and intense bursts of, of, of exercise or work and then actually um, a lot of time laying around and recovering and so our ancestors in the caves would have had hunting and then two weeks of laying around and it, right. nobody would would bother no email no <laughs> no jogging or or stuff like that exactly. I, I mean also what i find funny is think about it this way um can you imagine somebody in the stone age saying to his wife hey i'm i'm actually if something like a wife existed back then but going and saying um i think i'll have to burn some calories i go out and, and run around the savannah did it happen? <laughs> and they I would think, think you're nuts, you right? Get, you, get your, you get your answer. You would run into the uh, risk of being completely tired out when you run into a real threat and being eaten. And so, no, would not have happened. I would also like to talk about your, your first job experiences. So after your studies, you then also ended at GCA Altium, a global investment bank providing strategic M&A advisory. What did you actually take away from, from that job? Because they have also advised many well-known exits here in the startup scene. So, for example, Bexio to Mobiliar or also Amorana. They mm -hmm. supported them with the exit. So, why did you decide to join the M&A side and not start your own company? Um, so, actually, it's it's a quite um, uh, and typical uh, typical journey, right? Uh, I like to challenge myself, and so uh, when I was in university, I I uh, decided to do an internship with a um, strategic uh, strategy consulting firm called Solon, and uh, they staffed me in their in their um, London office, and I, I kind of uh, had my fair share of uh, of, of long nights there, <laughs> and I, I I recognized the pattern, and, and the pattern was that the partners there, um, like the really successful consultants, they all had uh, earned their their um, their first stripes on their uniform in 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 M &A, uh, namely Green Hill, Lazar, and and, some, and and I was like, okay, there's clearly something, at least about the two or three years when mm -hmm. you start out uh, in a, in your job in your career um, to investment banking, and okay. and um, that that um, that really intrigued me, and I wanted to 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 land it a gig in uh, investment banking and uh, GC Altium ended up uh, um, hiring me you know, right off the, out of the internship and I love the culture there, I love the people there, still love them, shout out here and um, uh, the learning curve was just amazing. Um, as you said, you, you work on so many different deals, you, you get insight into so many different um, business models, into so many different value creation models in a way um, um, and, and that was so interesting um, and um, I would never miss that time because it's kind of um, when you think about it if you want to become good at something you have to put in the 10,000 hours right when you go into investment banking and you compare yourself to your peers that kind of work 9 to 5 and you work every day 10 to 13 hours you pretty fast 
have your 10,000 hours on the clock, right? And you just suck in all this information and then and, and just uh, have all these role models around you. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to start for, for young grads to, to really um, gain, gain experience that, that will pay off big time later in their career. Right. Did you have like this big master plan where you said, okay, first I go to the investment banking, to the M&A side to acquire some skills and knowledge. And afterwards, I do want to start my own company, or did that thought just emerge during your time at GCLT? So, um, I'm actually a bit of a Bunsley. I would have never done that. <laughs> I, I, I said, okay, I go into investment banking. I clearly can work hard. I, I, um, I have some, um, some uh, analytical skills, um, and I will save, I have a high saving rate, uh, invest, and then how is the, 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 the term fire, uh, fire, uh, like, uh, exactly. Yeah. Financial uh, independence, retire. Yeah. Fi early. Financial independence, retire early. Uh, and so that was the plan actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then actually you, I was sucked into this, into this, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, route, uh, in a way. Um, and I think yeah, we will come to that now, or right? uh, it it was never the plan to really like I will do that and then I will do do that. And actually, um, like with with a lot of good uh, entrepreneurship stories, that the value creation or that the, the the opportunity to create value uh, that we that we saw in high intensity training, um, that kind of uh, then set all the things in motion that we that we started our own company. I think there it's, it was also your, your co-founder, Philip, that you actually met at GCA, right? Yeah. And he had an injury that then basically brought you back to the high intensity hit training that then eventually led to the foundation of Aurum. Can you talk about that story, you know, how one thing led to the other that you then both ended up founding Aurum together? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really funny because you're sitting around in an investment bank and in a junior level. Uh, from Monday to Friday evening and you're actually seeing the other guy he was sharing a cubicle with me all the time so you you know yourself uh, you know the other guy better than some of your friends because you spend so much time together and and um, at one point he asked me like hey you look really buffed like you you clearly go to the gym a lot right but Actually, I cannot, I cannot explain this because you are always here with me. So when do you find the time? And I, I said, I train once a week. For me, but that, at that point, it was completely natural to, to train once a week, a high intensity strength right. training workout lasting for 20 minutes. Uh, and he was like, what? How is that possible? No way. Are you juicing? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, no, I, come with me. I'll show you. And um, so we went to... Um, to Medlek, uh, it's it's a former franchise, a franchisee of Kisa uh, in uh, in uh, Küsna, mm -hmm. and I gave him his first high intensity training of his of his of his life. So in the basic high intensity training consists of a leg press, a row, a chest press, a pull down, and an overhead press. So it's it's five simple movements, and um, we would go in there with a with a uh, paper and pen and really protocol okay this was the setting of the, of the leg press machine you lasted for 126 seconds uh, on with this weight and then we would wait uh, a, a week and after the week we would go back and do the, the exactly same training and see okay now you lasted with the same weights everything's the same uh, like 20 or 30 seconds longer mm -hmm. and then we would go up the, with the weight and that approach um, to strength training, the simplicity of it and the, the quantification of it and this clearly um, always trying to be super productive in the gym, that, that struck with him and, and he, he gained a lot of, of muscle in that time and after a while he said, hey, I had this, this long-standing injury in my, in my shoulder and it's completely gone. <laughs> this is so amazing and uh, he asked me like why does nobody know about this why can I not type in high intensity training Zurich and find a, a, a provider of this 
and that was actually what led to the foundation of our room. And yeah. Awesome. So you basically solved your own problem to a certain degree. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's probably the best motivation to have uh, to then actually also start and build a company out of that. Yeah, it, it was so. It was simple in many ways, but also in many ways it was super difficult because one big obstacle was um, that we would come out of a world with M&A where things are just finished. You, you meet the companies when they are um, right before their exit. And uh, many things are already syst like in, in systems and, and it's, it's hundreds of people working at these companies and, and you kind of have this barrier of like doing um, these super small steps that you do in, find, in, in founding a company, like finding a supplier, finding a lease, like mm -hmm. what, what uh, kind of a, of a company will be found, a, a GmbH or an AG. And, and uh, yeah, kind of that was then the school of hard knocks to yeah. open a, a small shop and, and giving these trainings. Got it. So we know you met Philip, your co-founder at GC Altium, but what actually makes a good team? Because you seem to have both a pretty similar business background. Mm -hmm. You both work at the investment bank, but to build a company, you usually need a more diverse skill set of, of the people founding it, right? So how did you split the roles and what made you a good team despite having a similar background? Um, so Philip has a, a natural, um, a natural, uh, talent in in uh, things like legal and and finance. He's a chartered financial accountant, chartered uh, management accountant. Uh, he uh, is uh, is an Excel wizard, and um, and so this this legal and and financial and controlling side of the business um, is is really what um, what he um, can can do really well. And what I do is actually. Um, the emotional part, in a way, of, of the business. I'm, I'm, uh, um, I've, I've, I've read a lot of things about uh, marketing, and I've, 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 uh, I've, I have a feeling for, kind of, I have a lot of empathy uh, for people, and that that makes me a really good marketer, and and also drives, um, um, like the marries the the insights from hard data, with um, like sanity checks of of, of what what is really working in the real world kind of um, that was really really important later on when I became the product owner for our own development of the machine so um, he he's a really analytical guy and and um, I'm more of the emotional guy and that's kind of the best best marriage uh, in business that you can have I guess yeah sounds like a good complementary skill set yeah absolutely we already talked a bit about the HIT training and how it works, but do you also have some stats that you can share based on your clients training at our room these days about the actual effect of HIT training, how effective it actually is? Yeah. So um, as, as you know, Simon uh, joined us as, uh, as our, our CTO um, this, this, uh, this year. And uh, the first thing he, he did was he looked at all the data, he kind of put out like all this strength training data and nobody has to has to uh, um, be afraid it's like like strength training data is the most impersonal thing that there is you cannot see from a strength curve or from a strength development who who was that person so that's yeah. kind of strength data is is we are all humans we all all have the kind of the same strength um, data that we that we put out there uh, but he looked at, at our whole sample of people um, um, more than 2,000 people uh, that have ever done this training with us and he, he, he boiled down to okay what is the weekly gain of people coming to us uh, on average like mm -hmm. it's it's uh, from the 16 year old super athlete to the 94 year old uh, grandma that wants to stay fit and he found out uh, although this analysis is not super statistically significant because mm -hmm. the, the data is, uh, is so diverse, but it's 3% on average, like 3% per, per week that wow. you become better. Yeah. And, and people cannot fully appreciate this before they feel it. Um, I often say strength is the most underrated health marker out there. Because when you think about it, when you die, your strength goes to zero. And over a lifetime, your strength becomes less and less and less. And then we have this picture of the old man walking with a stick. 
it's really about strength because strength is the corollary with muscle mass muscle mass is the corollary with a good cardiovascular system central nervous system and, and all these things and so three percent stronger each week uh is is compounding uh over over 10 to 20 um sessions to a really significant improvement in, in quality of life and depending on the goal also with like more muscle mass more toning for for women that's a big a big topic and and when you have this yardstick every week okay i, I have become three percent better that's also a psychological yeah. factor that's just like it, it makes you keep on doing this and that's yeah. all that counts uh yeah and what i really appreciate about that is it's very data driven so you you have the numbers and you know you know how people improve i think that's another key aspect of delivering that product basically absolutely i mean um to be to be a bit um uh to differentiate a bit um the, the quality of our service in the first if you are really unfit and you do the do everything you do uh in the beginning will work uh where kind of um the really good methodologies separate themselves from things that uh, are not so good is after the week 10. if you can still deliver consistent improvements after week 10 um you really have a, a high a highly potent uh, exercise uh, regime that you that you're giving to people and um, that that is really what we look at uh, now um, when you come to us and you start out and after week 10 and you have still improvements uh, after week 10 um, then we're doing our job right and 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 people do have improvements like what to one to two years out after they started working out with us they still become stronger and and that makes total sense because um, like the, the literature su suggests that people that are athletes that really train to become their absolute best to then go to Olympic Games or, or, or try to be the world record they need up to two to three years of consistent really really good training to reach that level yeah. and so that's what we see in normal people and and, and that's amazing and now, of course, the question arises, how do you actually deliver these results? How does your training concept, your experience work? You promise results in just six minutes per training, yep. which sounds insane from the outside perspective. If I wouldn't have tried it myself, I think this is not, this is not, never yeah, going to work. So how, how does it actually work? Please explain that. Um, so y you said in the beginning, it's, it's a gym, but it's, it's, it's everything but the gym. And, uh, and and that's true. I think um, the, the only thing that we have in common with the gym is, is the business model. It's, there's a, a physical yeah. location. Can you try to solve this, um, this, uh, this time place equation with a, with, a, with a person? You just have to meet them somewhere. There's a physical location. Um, what we identified was that you need actually uh, a coach to do this, this, this training. I think the biggest misconception and that goes back to first principles is that people can do strength training on them on their own um, and that's that's the premise on which the whole industry of gyms is actually built on gyms are not aspiring to deliver results gyms are just renting out equipment to you for you to use how you use it is up to you yeah. And uh, and that's where like the trouble starts for most people. And um, actually, that's quite funny. Now there was something in in, in Blick the, on Monday. Uh, I have to post about it in, in LinkedIn. It's where they uh, change their um, their um, their contracts to more reflect uh, the the Swiss rental uh, law because it's rental law under which these contracts fall, and it just goes to show that. They just rent out equipment and, and don't aspire to deliver results. And so what we identified is you, people need a coach to actually um, go through the training with them. Uh, it's really important. It, it has a multiple, multiple benefits. You actually have an appointment with a person, so that helps with compliance. Um, you actually go there and what a coach does is he, he helps you to be productive when you are there. 
I mean, that's the, the, the second really important thing. Um, many people go to the gym and then just look at the clock and, and after an hour they feel good that they've done something and they go home. I've been there, so I, I get the results, right? Yeah. But that's not the thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So you, the coach will, will make you do it right. And um, then the third thing that, or the third insight that we had was um, that there is a, a actually a market niche uh, between the, the gym that mm -hmm. is having no coaching at all and the personal training. Crowd. Yeah. If you think about it in terms of classical economics, uh, there's the luxury segment and then there's the discount segment, but there, there's no premium segment in the middle. So uh, that is just delivering a lot of value per Swiss rank that you have to give for it. Yeah. Kind of think about um, uh, a, a thing like Uber, which I also see in the premium segment because the discount segment would be the bus, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, we saw this opportunity that people just only pay for these 20 minutes of coaching while they do their, their training, not uh, everything around it, right? Talking with the coach or uh, sure. having the coach drive to your home. This is all stuff that, that regular people don't want to pay for. And so we, we, we stripped it down to this simple, okay, you have the coach with you for these 20 minutes. That was the first really important thing. Mm -hmm. And then the, the big question was, what tool will this coach use to make you do this strength training, right? And then there is kind of this thing that, that kind of classifies us now as a startup, um, where we said, are weights the right tool for the job anymore? And, and the classical, or the, the, the answer was, no, they are not. Why and that's not? shocking. Like the, for so many people, wow. Yeah. Weight training, it's in the name, right? Um, so weights actually work with gravity, right? And so if you um, have too much weight, um, the weight will at one point during the exercise become a problem because it wants to go to the center of the earth. If you cannot uh, do the, the exercise properly anymore, it will, it will hurt you or, or, or worse. And so people have a natural uh, respect for weights and they will always, when they train alone especially, they will always choose too, too little weight and then over time uh, progress stalls and everything like that. So that's the first thing. It's, it's, it's not a, a human friendly tool to do strength training. It's, it's, uh, it has a lot of flaws in, from a safety perspective. And the next thing is that, I mean, we live in a, in a world where we can quantify so many things. I think the Apple Watch will now, the new Apple Watch will also have a glycogen level in your, in your blood and stuff like that. But we still measure strength in kind of five kilo plates or ten kilo plates. Like how? how yeah, that's not that's not exactly granular, right? Right, and, and not sure. digital at all. So you would walk around with uh, something, a notepad, and note down. Okay, today I had twelve point five kilos, and and we we're talking about, and, and let's also let let's talk about that later when we come to product market fit. These are regular people. They don't want to walk around kind of writing down what was their weight. Kind of that's that's hardcore bodybuilding stuff and, and so that's the second flaw of weights. It's not easily quantifiable. And the third thing was that um, that struck us was um, when you go to the gym or you use weights, you always have to set up the the equipment again and again and again. It's a, it's a typical repetitive task it's it's so time consuming and stuff like that and and so the third thing that we said there needs to be a high degree of automation once set up for a person the machine has to adjust every time you log in that person to reflect these settings yeah. and then that it goes full circle because if you have if you control the automation and the settings are always the same then the data makes sense all of a sudden because you're always training with the same settings and then you can start really doing cool analysis around strength improvements for people and so yeah that's that's how we went about it awesome in that regard you also have a, a marketing slogan you you call it like train like an astronaut where, where does that come from you know what's the the meaning behind that sentence when that's always a, it's it's really always nice to see the epiphany in people's faces when you t uh, tell them um, because weights need gravity, right? Yeah. Um, if I say I do 100 kilos of uh, leg press here on Earth, that would mean nothing on like the moon or <laughs> on Mars, right? Yeah. While if you used our machine, it, was, it would always be the same resistance. You would always feel the same uh, um, 
depending on where you are in the solar system or beyond. And so that's really cool, right? Because um, I firmly believe that we will use this actually to then do long distance travel in the solar system uh, because um, pe people, it's one of the biggest problems. It's uh, astronauts lose so much bone density and muscle mass during time in uh, zero gravity. And, and so with this system, you can actually do a strength training like you would do here on Earth. Yeah. And, and that's how the slogan train like an astronaut came, came about. Awesome. And the other thing is it's actually a classic case of the science was there first and mm -hmm. we just built the tool or the service to really apply the science to people consistently. Yeah. And so uh, astronauts, I hope, train with the newest science and, and technology. Hopefully. If not, they know whom to call from now on. I hope so. You know, talking about building that experience from scratch. So you have the science background, but you still, you needed machines, you needed locations, you needed money. That's a big, big challenge by itself. So how do you actually go about to open the first two locations? So um, we found a um, we found a supplier in the in the U.S. Um, that has um, has built similar machines. Uh, it's it's built on this premise of the isokinetic exercise um, principle, and and that uh, that was in found uh, that was invented in the 70s and 80s by. Mm -hmm. um, uh, physiotherapists uh, and um, that kind of beautiful techno te technology or way of, of, of producing force to train muscle actually uh, was laying around in, in physiotherapy now for, for decades and nobody thought about applying it to strength training uh, for, for fitness and, 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 other, and other applications and so um, what uh, what the supplier from the US uh, gave us he gave us a uh, a starting point for the for the machine that we could could actually use uh, to give this high intensity training uh, it was not optimal it was actually designed to um, give uh, like 40 different exercises and stuff like that and we only way used, more than you yeah, needed we right? only used six and it had it had many other other things that we wanted to do better uh, yeah. but it gave us a, a, a simple way of um, just um, deploying a, a minimal viable product which was in this yeah. case a studio in Zurich with me as a coach and this machine and seeing how how this model works in that regard you know many other people that would have had the same idea I could imagine that they said no we don't want to use any existing machine we want to build our very own product from the beginning yeah. Why did you decide not to do that? Because that would have also been a path to, to pursue from day one, basically. So um, to be to be super uh, um, um, super uh, true, how do you say like uh, to to be super to tell the truth? Yeah. Uh, we did not imagine building it ourselves from the beginning. Okay. In the beginning, we were like, um, okay, um, this is actually the perfect machine to do this because it solves this all these problems that I that I talked about and we wanted right. to to build a a small business around it that um, just does the business system right uh, like training the trainers um, um, franchising was always a, a distribution option for us we wanted to to build a business around that and and did not uh, know from the beginning that we want to build the technology in-house and um, that that was the simple the simple uh, the simple answer to that. Afterwards, it, it turned out to be such a big advantage because we could test um, this this whole model and learn so much from customers um, without the risk of of deploying five hundred thousand or a million before knowing yeah. okay this this technology works really well with customers and so. Um, that that's that's the reason why we we, we bought these machines we, we didn't know better be, before so I, I think it's also a perfect approach of going about building an MVP first and then you actually see oh there are certain drawbacks that you need to correct and then you build your own product yeah I mean, uh, wonderful. Like a, a good friend of mine is, is Beat Wolfley from from Signum and he's like and uh, we were sitting around already uh, in investment banking and and discussing okay maybe we can we can uh, do a, a software for uh, dentists because we mm -hmm. had just so, uh, sold the Zahnarztzentrum and they uh, they had this 
the, the software there is, is really just like the first line must have been written in, in the 90s. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, but we can just do design an interface and then let uh, human labor in the, in the back end do the task, like in, <laughs> in India or something right, like yeah. that. And for our work week uh, with Tim Ferriss was really popular at that time. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's the way of going about uh, an MVP. Uh, it's 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 uh, do things that don't scale don't don't try to over engineer it and, and make it perfect and and my experience now is if you try to make it perfect from the start it will be so imperfect and buggy that you have to scrap it all together and we have also had a fair share of that yeah well, we're going to talk about the development of your own machine in in a second but before i would like to talk about covid covid has basically affected you know all the leisure and also fitness, uh, you know, industries out there massively. So you also had to close your your operations. In in what way has COVID really affected you and also your balance sheet in that regard? So um, from the from the uh, spirit of the organization perspective, we are on, on such a uh, forward momentum uh, that we were actually. And this might sound a bit um, counterintuitive. We were actually happy for in the first lockdown to catch up, <laughs> six yeah. weeks of catching up, right? Like because the backlog was so big at that at that point in time already, and we had so many initiatives and stuff that we wanted to do. So uh, for for the management, which was partly or, uh, still in the in the operational business, that was. Um, in a in a in a way good because we could really work on the on the bigger vision of the company. I mean, um, the first lockdown from a balance pe- balance sheet perspective was o- okayish. Mm-hmm. Um, you you will never get back um, your operating cash flow. That's kind yeah. of a reality. You are just closed, and um, they will they will try to do their best to give you. Um, something um, in, like some financial aid to make up for it, but you will never. If you are uh, having, if if your if your if your units economics are, are positive and you generate cash from operations, you will never get that back. And, and that's that's uh, it's just the way f- it is for everybody, and it's it's a pity. Um, but um, in in this before the second lockdown happened in November this last year, I had. Um, the intuition that actually it would be a quite opportune time to to raise more cash uh, to to do a Series A uh, because uh, in in many industries this whole lockdown and 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 COVID time has been not a changer but an an accelerant of change mm-hmm. um, trends that have been there before like in e-commerce. Um, yeah. or, or or telemedicine will not go like the genie won't go back into the bottle it's it's there to stay now right uh, and it's the same with us um, th- we had our strongest month ever right before the lockdown in November because we have this one-on-one setting uh, people were sitting on a, on a lot of um, pent up um, spending power from mm-hmm. the first lockdown so they, they decided to uh, choose a more premium offering uh, regarding their health and and talking about health, health was just in the top of their minds. So right. um, we said it's actually a good time uh, to raise cash, although like our operations were shut down and, and investors agreed because, yeah, I think the time that is, is starting now is is, is, is an extremely good time for us, especially also with the start of the franchising now. And yeah, you basically took the contrarian approach again. So yep. in that regard, that yep. that was the. the good I was actually I was actually writing an, an SMS to my mentor Alex Grünwald, and I, I said, "Hey, don't tell me I'm I'm uh, I'm crazy, but I want to raise cash." And he was like, "Yeah, great idea." And I was like, "Okay, okay, not what I expected. <laughs> not what I expected." <laughs> Fair point. And then what you actually did with that cash was you developed your very own machine. That was no, like no, that was the seed. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. So what we did with the seed round, it was in November. We, uh, in end of 2018, we were uh, seeing, like they were six months old, like yeah. operationally six months old. We were seeing that this is clearly working. Uh, we were seeing this because of the high referral rate. Uh, people were um, really, really, um, 
um, amazed and happy with this new service in town and uh, the referral rate was was really really high I think 60 70 percent something like that wow. and um, so he said okay we have obviously something that is that is working now we have to figure out how do we build a business around this that is that is not just one store and, and me giving the trainings and, and stuff right. like that and so um, when we f when you think about building a business you 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 have to think about building systems like it's it must not be people dependent it must be systems dependent and w what kind of systems do you have you have informational systems which are kind of this is how we do things this can be an operations manual a handbook or something like that mm -hmm. um, and you have hard systems um, these are things like we have um, these logos this is these are our colors uh, we have these uniforms these are hard systems and also hardware uh, kind of what machines do we use fall under this category of, of systems and um, so we saw our biggest problem to scaling we saw in hardware in, in, in the machine mm -hmm. um, because um, there were many ways um, in the beginning when for example Philip would, would set up a user on the machine it would be completely different setup than what I did Okay. and uh, and stuff like that because I think this from the supplier from from the US their strength was the versatility but for us there was a big weakness we wanted to have a streamlined system of, mm -hmm. of, of how you give these trainings and so this whole story started of hey why don't we build this machine that can do all these six workouts uh, all these six exercises that we do and not have two machines like we had to you to buy from the US right and and also why can we not just build the perfect settings into the software and stuff and so um, that really kick-started these um, that we want to build our own machine and mm -hmm. obviously our our cash did not suffice to to build this machine and so we said we have to to raise a seed round and and and, and find money to to build this machine and uh, we built a, a beautiful deck <laughs> <laughs> that was much too detailed and and went out there and tried to to raise some cash and um, um, we were like for six months we were not successful because uh, as always it's it's kind of in the seed stage um, and also if you don't have these these groundbreaking new ideas like uh, a, a true zero to one idea, for example, like Airbnb, mm -hmm. uh, where you really change to the game entirely. Uh, it's it's really hard because you have you're always going to be compared with a lot of already existing offerings in the market, which, by the way, has also happened to Airbnb, right? It's it's kind of sure, but. Um, you need to have this one friendly investor that was in our case then uh, Simon and Matthias in, in the in the end that said yes I think that's going to work and I'm your valuation right let's do it let's just let's just do it and then everything else fell into place and we, we closed around within a month Wow. that was in November yeah. of 2019 and so uh, in December 2019 we were like okay let's now we have to build this machine. We had started uh, with, with with design and, and, and also first prototyping before. Um, and we, we had a clear picture of, one, of what we want to build. And then mm -hmm. we, we went into it. Um, I think what I would love to go back to that time with the experience that I have now. <laughs> because I, uh, I became kind of the, the product owner at that point. And... Um, Building um, we, for this machine, we built a back end, a front end, a, a firmware, um, the hardware, all simultaneously and all not in house. Like there can so many things that can go wrong if you have the yeah. great team in house doing this, right? And we had different agencies working with us uh, to to build this, and and the team did a a phenomenal job to really bring it to the prototype three, prototype four phase of where we could really see this thing becoming uh, a, a serious ready uh, product and where we can give trainings with which we can give trainings and um, 
it's it was just it was just amazing in how, into how many problems you 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 will run mm -hmm. uh, and you really need to have this mindset this problem is a good thing because we found it out we found out about it now we can fix it and we don't have to fix it again and again and again it's yeah. just then it's going to be fixed we we found out how to do it and and uh, over the course of, of of nine months this slowly but surely uh, became what is our room one today and is, is standing in the studios and uh, the heavy lifting it has been done and it's just now uh, hardening and, and making it even better for the future I'm, I'm really impressed by what your team pulled off there because you know whoever you ask they say hardware or software but never combine the two you will just have nightmares over nightmares it's, it's so it's so it, you really need to have um a, a high pain <laughs> tolerance <laughs> <laughs> because with software if you find a bug you can fix it within yeah, a morning right. deploy it and it's done but yeah. with hardware you it's it's um most of the times two weeks a cycle takes two weeks or a month find out about it then you find a solution then you find a, a, a proper way of, of, of doing it of applying it then it, it takes time until the thing the things arrive you have to order them it's, it's it's just takes so much longer and we had actually signed two more stores right which we wanted to Zug and Zangan and we, which we, we wanted to open with this machine and so we had sure. hard deadlines um, the, the rent already starting and, and stuff like that and you were like uh, always on edge and thinking okay this we can go bust if we cannot uh, make this work mm -hmm. and um, I have I, I love the saying burn the boats and, and that's a classic case of burn the boats we we, we just had to yeah. <laughs> and and that makes uh, so much so that that really uh, vitalized the whole team and, and, and made it vigilant and, and like just just let's do it and Thomas Hofer which is kind of our uh, holder of the whole uh, machine now mm -hmm. and also the back end uh, the, the, the product owner for this now he worked to together with me on on pulling it off and we would have nights in St. Gallen where we were uh, drilling holes into the heart into the into the machine because something was not holding or fixing something and, yeah. and um, yeah it's kind of you, you, you don't you don't give up one meter and you try to to f do everything you can in one day to just make it happen and and then and, and all of a sudden the last bug is fixed and it's 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 working and that i i can remember that day it was 24th of august uh 2020 the last bug was fixed and then it was just working and it how felt, did that feel that's magic, that was right? just that was just beautiful because we had a, a, still a bug in the in the in the in the in the firmware communication layer and we could not find out where this bug was and it was mm -hmm. actually deeply deep deep inside the actually um, um, a, a, a piece that we bought from ST Link it's a supplier and uh, the communication with the MacBook that we uh, the, the Mac that we use was was kind of the problem and actually the solution was just to bypass a, a little thing that you would normally break um, after you after you have completely um, um, finished the, the the programming of the board and we we decided to leave it on there yeah. because of, of budget reasons and that that was the problem and so when we bypassed that this little this little piece that you would normally break off uh, everything worked and then it was like wow and and then seeing people that had seen the old hardware or the old machine coming to the training and and being like whoa did you guys build this <laughs> did you, with your little scrappy office down there in Loon Street yeah, yeah. Like, did you do this and uh, that was really cool that was yeah that was really cool I but can imagine um, hardware software is is brutal it's brutal, it's tough, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, but it's doable as you just proved. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I mean, also, we, we, we it was not so complicated what we built, right? We did mm -hmm. not build a, a better um, 
um, um, nuclear fusion reactor or something like that, right? Not yeah, maybe that will come in the future, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we built an exercise machine, so that also helped. We, it was not super complicated, but uh, but still, it's yeah. it's. Um, I have the, the greatest respect, for example, for Tesla, like what they have pulled off for SpaceX. It's uh, it's 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 so much that can go wrong. Uh, yet the more complex the device becomes. Yeah. I would also like to talk about your opponents and supporters along the, the way of building Aurum so far. Now, when you talk about opponents, you basically, in the market that you're active, although you have a very unique positioning, but still when people from the outside look at the market, they think, okay, I could go and train at the regular gym, I could go to an EMS studio, I could book a personal trainer, use my fitness app. So it's a very crowded, but also very busy market with lots of competition. How do you stand out there and do you even compete with these other players? So, um, I think to say we don't have competition would, would be wrong, right? right? You always have competition. There's always a, a, a substitute of, for what you're doing. Um, but in, our, in, in the value that we provide to customers, I think we, we don't have a, a, a clear substitute. And um, what always what always struck me was that um, you have these um, twenty percent of people depends on on where you are. For example, yeah. in, in Zurich, we always talk about the penetration rate of, of fitness studio and stuff like that. So it's around fifteen to twenty five percent, depending on where you are in Europe. And all these uh, players try to target these twenty five percent. So, the gyms, um, the um, the gyms in the in the regular in the in the different ways they are set up. Like you have these luxury gyms where you where you have uh, more amenities and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In the end, they always target people that want to go to the gym, and um, and also people, for example, with the fitness apps that that know how to do training. They they mm -hmm. just they know how to do it and they, they love. Uh, the experience of these fitness apps, um, and so the only the only uh, competitor that, that we have that is that is really left that targets people that have um, little time and that want to have a one-on-one -on -one coaching are are the EMS studios, and the EMS studios were also in the beginning a a great proxy for us to to kind of look at the development of that market and and gain confidence in in uh, how how um, people will react to our offering mm -hmm. and so um, I, I, I like I like what they are doing and I, I, I could see that um, this is clearly working um, when you think about it we are in many ways similar to EMS but for EMS mm -hmm. so we, we we don't have electric suits or stuff like that we just use our machine it's it's, it's real strength training and um, for for many people um, it is it is really the next thing after EMS. Many people say, oh, I like this model with the trainer and an appointment, and but now I will do our room. Right? I will do the astronaut training, and and that is <laughs> kind of that is kind of really funny to see. And um, what I like about this positioning of, of EMS and, and us is we target these eighty percent of people that are not planning or would never go to a gym. Mm -hmm. You 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 mentioned your your girlfriend, right? Like, these are the pe the people that want to enjoy a, a, a training or a, a strength training workout, but they would never go to a gym and they would never do it at home, and and they know it. And um, by the way, there is also twenty percent of people that you will never convince to do any sports. So, what we do uh, is we target the sixty people, the sixty percent of people. That, that that know they need to do something but yeah. they haven't found a service yet that that makes sense to them and it's it's a blue it's a classic blue ocean strategy it's kind of um, we were in the beginning like these numbers can't these new customer numbers can't be going on <laughs> forever like that right because at one point you think but it's it's, it's, it's new customers are accelerating mm -hmm. because there's so many people that search for something but haven't found something yet 
and um, yeah, we were like, okay, if nobody wants to serve these these people, sure, then we will do it. It reminds me a bit about the common saying where you say the the difference between communism and capitalism is. You know, you focus on tapping into untapped fields, untapped markets to make the pie bigger instead of being stuck with the 20% yep. in the fitness market and trying to slice it and taking market share away from other people Absolutely. or other organizations. You want to go in untapped, much like three times bigger market. And that's super interesting. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, also the, that's also the explosion and was also the, 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 the story now for the Series A when, when investors understood this no. um, because um, the applications of this are are huge. Uh, as I said, strength is the most underappreciated health marker out there. Um, we we measure steps just because steps are easy to measure, but it doesn't right. mean that it's a good measure. <laughs> yeah. um, and so the application now that we focus on is is fitness and and just regular building muscle and and, and losing weight, like the classic fitness problem that we have in the Western world, but for elderly care or for rehabilitation or for um, also working with people that have uh, neuronal problems, uh, muscle neuronal problems and, mm -hmm. and all these things, you will always have this therapeutic model with, with our machine and it's, it's, such a, it's such a big market and yeah. um, nothing has such a big impact on the quality of life uh, than building muscle and strength for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's where that's where this this comes from, that we are not really thinking about competition because the pie is so big. Right. In that regard, of course, also this comes with the cost. So you also have membership fees that you charge. They are higher than people might be used to from the traditional gyms, which is totally normal because yeah. you are going in a different market segment. But has this ever been uh, sort of an opponent to you that people say, "Oh no, this is actually too expensive for me." Yeah. I mean, um, in the beginning, when we were not, no, when we were like uh, not so good at um, positioning ourselves and marketing ourselves and mm -hmm. understanding who our customer really is, yeah. uh, that was a problem because we would uh, run an out of home ad and people would just come by and like students that are uh, traditionally uh, not on a, such a big budget right. would say, "This is really cool, but how much does it cost?" And they were like. I cannot afford this. So, um, what is what the beauty of this positioning is now, uh, especially for the Outfitness brand, is that these sixty percent that we talked about of people that are searching for a solution but haven't found a solution yet are really highly likely to also be short on time mm -hmm. because they have a job that is paying more than hundred thousand a year, and so it falls into place. They are valuing the time and so if you can give them this service in 20 minutes a week they say your your membership fee is 229 a month wow that's cheap so if you find the right customer you are not you're not expensive anymore you, you need to know your positioning uh, in the in the market and so the other day i got a i got a, a story from zook where a, a person was with us for the for the trial session and after the trial session she was wow this is amazing uh where can i do this in the us and we said it's not in the us yet it's just here in zook and zurich and right. she was what <laughs> <laughs> and i i like um and she was like uh, how, how much does it cost 300 350 a month and and the trainer was like no 229 and and she was wow <laughs> that's a that's that's a good deal and so if you find the right customer that's really seeing the value in, in this time saving and also getting this this done uh, the strength training um, then they then they say wow it's 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 a good price because if you think about it per training here in Zurich it's in the yearly abo it's uh, 55 Swiss francs so that's kind of an exp like a bit more bit more expensive business lunch and um, it's really also interesting to see that uh, if the if the if the problem is, is really severe, kind mm -hmm. of like I really have back pain or I, I really um, need, I, I can feel that I'm becoming weaker and weaker, like people with 55, 60 right. already, uh, they are really happy to pay our, our membership fee uh, because um, the, the problem 
is is there and they see the value in in getting rid of of uh, of back pain for example and yeah. stuff like that makes sense and then that that's actually also this positioning that is so crucial to then also achieve the product market fit in the right segment yeah Yep. So w was there anything, you know, that helped you to, to really find the right customer segment or was it really testing and learning along the time? It was it was testing. I mean, we had a, a, a strong um, um, hypothesis that it's people like us in the beginning, like right. professionals that are um, that are uh, short on time in the finance industry or legal okay. industry or consulting or, or stuff like that. Um, and these were also the first custom groups that came in. And then uh, we had this really interesting observation that they would oftentimes refer their parents. Uh, interesting. Like, okay, wow, this is interesting. And then their parents would come, which are, which are then kind of, we call these custom persona, the, the well-off pensioners, mm -hmm. because they, um, they um, got the referral from their, from their kids and they knew I need to do strength training if I want to really em enjoy my retirement to the fullest. Yeah. And so these, these uh, customer persona formed naturally. And um, the third customer persona that was really interesting to see was um, people that had an injury mm -hmm. and that were searching for muscle training with, with, a, with a therapeut like with not personal training, but muscle training with a therapist. And they would come in and we told them, look, this is for us, it's not a problem to give this training to you because this machine is actually originating from physio physical therapy and rehabil rehabilitation. And so this was the third customer persona that was forming. And also this then kicked off the whole certification process with uh, insurers nice. um, and, and, and stuff like that. And um, all these three personas have one thing in common: they they value one aspect of the um, of the service highly and and are willing to pay a, a certain premium for that. So the the rehabilitation and 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 pensioner crowd is is valuing the, the therapeutic aspect that there's somebody with you that you're quantifying the results mm -hmm. and that there's at one point in the future there's a certain number attached to the outcome of. Okay, you're right. pain free now, and yeah. that was the threshold of, of, of strength. And um, and for the for the for the younger folks that are still working, it's it's this time aspect. It's yeah. they understand that the best strategy is something that you can keep up doing, and so this twenty minutes a week is something everybody can do, um, mm -hmm. and 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 they are really happy about this this. Um, Kind of time machine that we have invented there where you can just right. squeeze three hours or four hours of gym into six minutes yeah fantastic or 20 minutes. let's also talk about your supporters you already mentioned some of your investors along the way um also simon for example who was also on the show simon schroeder and matthias is co-founder at uh Kumbran back mm -hmm. in the days he will also be on the show very soon they both invested in your company but are now also part of your operational yep. team. So yep. Yep. that's probably the best thing that could happen, right? I mean, yeah. So the supporters were from, from the beginning. It, uh, Alex Greenwald, my, my boss at GC Altium, he was like, at the beginning, I told him I want to found my own company. Yep. And he was like, let's go for lunch, <laughs> yeah. talk about this, or at least, uh, how, what do I have to do that you stay with us? <laughs> right. And he got, he got, he got uh, my pitch. And he got the enthusiasm in my eyes, I think, and he was like, okay, um, I will invest. <laughs> and I was like, this is, this is really cool. So if somebody, I, I have a, I, I had a, it's like a, a saying from uh, Steven Schwartzman in my, in my head that was, if somebody offers you money, take the money. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, he was a really supporter in, in the beginning because uh, obviously you, you, you still have to, uh, when you when you uh, in our investment banking you go this bonus cycles right and right. so we needed the bo the bonus of the of the, the upcoming bonus to found the company and and he was super fair with us um, he gave us a, a great bonus to to found this company and cool. was not kind of uh, I will give you like I, I will have a grudge uh, because you, you you leave us and he was really supporting this and 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 founding of the company and, and entrepreneurship. 
and he he still is kind of a, a big supporter of us because uh, he has a, a, an outstanding network in Switzerland uh, and beyond and uh, he's just a sports enthusiast and 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 um, yeah it, it's great to have him on board and then uh, Simon and and um, Matu they are uh, really a special pair like it's 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 amazing to have these guys on board uh, for once um, they were really really successful I think one of the the most successful startup teams uh, in recent years from Switzerland I mean, they basically did two exits right they first sold their own company yeah. and then the company that they sold to and were right. also shareholders did an yeah. IPO well, afterwards that, yeah, I mean, like Dyna, and Dynatrace has done great since yeah. then and, and so um, they are really um, passionate about health and sports and and, and, and sportsmanship and, comp uh, and competition. I mean, we have an internal competition about <laughs> who has the highest <laughs> score, right? Uh, and it, it's just amazing to have these guys on the team. And what I highly uh, value in, in, in them was that they looked at, at us and as I said, they were the catalyst for the seed round to really right. take off. Um, and said, wow, this is really something we want to do to to improve through our investing, to improve Switzerland and beyond uh, and, 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 and have a, a valuable uh, service put out there into the into the world. Nice. And, uh, and, and, and they have a really, a really great moral compass, both of them. And um, also this time around, again, they were like, hey, this, this, this pitch deck is really good. Uh, why don't we just do the majority of the round? Because <laughs> it's, it's actually, we are so passionate about this. We love the team. And by the way, we want to, to work with you. And so um, that was kind of an all in one. I mean, um, many founders out there will, will, will agree with me that it can be super frustra frustrating to talk to VCs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's kind of the classic theme with VCs is they are fund managers. We, we, don't, we, we cannot forget this. So um, what fund management does is uh, because of the, of the management fee, right? you want to have bigger funds. Mm -hmm. So you want to have a yearly performance or a really short term performance, two or three years, four years. And most of the time this often leads to things like um, that they, they they make story investments. But you remember the the scooter craze and stuff like that. Yeah. And so uh, because you you never get blamed for investing in the scooter startup back then, right? Yeah. And so it can be super frustrating to talk to VCs. And uh, what was really cool with with Simon and, and Meta because they knew us already. Uh, they understood everything that we said and uh, made sense of the data that we showed them and, and for them it was it was a no-brainer to invest in us also mm -hmm. this time around and um, and having them now with us um, in the in the office is is so um, it's it's again a steep learning curve because they are really seasoned founders and the way they go about things is is like light speed right they the execution machines both of them and you can really see what it means to be a successful founder to have a lot of experience and this is really um, also motivating me and, and and I learn from a lot from it and, and the whole team is super motivated yeah. with them uh, and it, it has, has has put the, the whole operation on a, on a new level in a way because you have a bit older people that are really experienced uh, that work with you and um, it's 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 just cool to have see some, somebody like Simon where you can just call him and ask him something about anything about right. being a father about yeah. about uh, hey I'm a CEO uh, I did not do anything productive today is this I was just in calls is this yeah. okay and it's, it's, it's okay it's okay and that's that's really good feedback how do you actually meet them or got introduced to them in the first place because that's the most critical part right that you get that initial connection um, then I think Stefan one of our uh, also our 
uh, investors and also working with us, the, the brother of, of, of Philip, he um, just made a, a LinkedIn kind of growth hacking style, like writing to everybody on LinkedIn that was also in St. Gallen in the university, right? Like right. All, you, would, you go through this list and you just write everybody, you just try to pull people in yeah. and hope to, to, to sell some, some apples. Yeah. And um, Matthias was just around. Mm -hmm. uh, they just had sold uh, the company and uh, he was just in Zurich, I think, for, for meetings. And he was like, wow, this is really cool. Uh, and he decided on the spot to book a trial mm -hmm. and he didn't even have sport clothes with him. And so he went to Manor and bought himself some sporting clothes. And uh, he, he came and did the training and he was so uh, amazed by it and he, he went all out. Uh, he, he I asked, can imagine. He yeah. asked us, <laughs> hey, do you guys have a kind of a, an isotonic drink or something? I, I can barely stand. <laughs> And, and he was like, um, he, there we informed him that we are also raising a seed round at the moment. And then he was like, yeah, wow, this is cool. Let me introduce you to Simon. We are searching for cool investments. And, and uh, that's how it, it all came about. Fantastic. And yeah, you've really come a long way. You basically grew from two locations to four locations today. You plan to open your eighth location later this year. Mm -hmm. You also have exponential growth in terms of customers. You broke one million in ARR. I mean, these are just crazy numbers and, and really strong things that you hit and milestones that you actually hit. So we all just wonder what's next for you. Um, at, at, in, in many ways, it's, it's so, it's so um, surreal, right? Because at one point you were still standing in, in the studio giving the trainings exactly. and just, you, it's all manageable, right? It's kind of, you have a store in two stores in Zurich, you have a store in Zug, yeah. then you have a store in St. Gallen and it starts to, to work. Uh, and we were always um, looking at this company like a classical um, small business. Mm -hmm. um, or SMB, like a Kaimu, like yeah, yeah. and we are Kaimu. Like we were never thinking about it as a startup. Um, we were also trying uh, with the seed round. We were trying to to become cash flow positive again. Uh, we're not planning on build, uh, on on on, uh, on raising another round. And uh, so for us, it was um, always the plan to scale this via via franchising. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we worked on the franchising documentation. We will have the pilot in, in Stuttgart later, later this year and yes. hopefully also one in Munich and, and Lucerne and, and open uh, our, our fifth corporate store in, in Basel. And then from there, I think we will be slow compounders. Um, we will not try to open 100 stores in, in a year. We will. We will we will compound at an attractive rate um, for for many years to come because mm -hmm. uh, we 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 have done the heavy lifting of of, uh, of building our own machine. We you you could not copy this even if you had a billion. It's I I love a saying and the team is always telling me about this. Uh, you cannot build a baby with nine women in one month. And and so um, yeah, we are now trying to build a, a company that is system dependent, that is really also working without us and, 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 and scale it through franchising. And then what, what I, what, or what, what is really a, a big passion of mine is, 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 is elderly care. So mm -hmm. what, what I would love to, to venture out into is, is this whole thing of how can we, with our technology and know-how, give people above 60, 70, 80, the strength to enjoy life. Like that's, that's our tagline. Yeah. For younger people, it's, it's not really so important when you're 30 or in your 40s, you think, yeah, the strength to enjoy life. Like I want muscle, I want to be, I, would, I want to look sexy in my bikini, yeah? But for the elder people, strength is really becoming a thing of, hmm, will I go down to the, to the, um, post box today or will I not uh, yeah, exactly. and stuff like that things that are for us so natural but for 
for elder people it's really a severe uh, drag on their on their um, health and also mm-hmm. on their uh, quality of life and so what I would love to uh, as soon as we have um, proven this arm fitness uh, brand to be a, a, a great brand that is growing for years on end um, that we turn that I turn my creative juices to to solving this this problem uh, of, of elderly people really having no muscle and then and just yeah dying early because of it and, and not having uh, so much so much joy in life because of it yeah. that's a great vision to chase I would say yeah in that regard you know you have investors you have an investment banking M&A background so people might also wonder do you have any exit plans with your company because sooner or later your investors probably also expect any return on their investment yeah I mean um, it's 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 always um, interesting to see how, how it will develop um, will at one point somebody come and ask us hey we would love to buy you right um, you will always listen uh, you have to <laughs> you have kind of a fiduciary duty to your investors um, yeah. to um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm of the of the opinion that if you have a, comp- a durable competitive advantage and you have a great team and you and you have still not personal reasons to sell um, yeah. why sell Be- the transactions costs are high um, you um, y- if you have a vessel in which you can compound an attractive rate of return for for years and years and years um, why would you sell it and and so uh, that's the, that's the same thing with 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 our man like the way Philip and I are wired um, we are not looking for a, a quick exit. We want to to build something that has um, has durable value and that is um, really something that people um, love to have in their lives. And so that would be um, that would be a, a counter to this to this way of thinking about uh, building mm-hmm. a company that we have deeply ingrained in us and now let me let the investment banker speak in me <laughs> um, it would be amazing it would be really amazing to provide liquidity to our investors through an IPO that would be my dream yeah. that would be really my dream I mean um, I uh, I love all I, I've been as an M&A advisor in the private markets but uh, I love the public markets it's really a passion of mine and it's just uh, um, it's really for me. It's a it's a milestone of a company if you can really uh, become uh, such as such a, a great brand that you not sell out but go public and 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 enable uh, every um, investor to to own a, an an ownership stake in the company. And when you think about it, uh, all great brands or when I look at my little portfolio now it's kind of I, I'm really proud to to own Airbnb for example right because whenever I go with my little family on a vacation and it's just such a great invention and I'm so thankful for this and I, I, I love to I, I love to own shares in the company or for example Amazon right right it's kind of I love for example this now we are binging the uh, expands uh, uh, Amazon Originals on, on Prime. It's just they produce this content um, and they deliver it for. I think the Prime membership is one hundred a year, and you can just. I mean, they deserve to be so valuable now because they provide so many things to people that are like really valuable, mm-hmm. and so um, that's the way I think about it. I w- I would love to 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 really work until I can um, bring bring this this company public that would be a, that would be a dream come true awesome I think it would be very good also for the whole startup ecosystem to have more startups you know scaling up and then going public I think that would be a tremendous story uh, absolutely I mean if you if you think about it what I what I don't understand um, from a from a perspective of entrepreneurship is build just for a big competitor already in mind mm-hmm. to sell out to I mean it's it's a business model uh, it's and it's 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 completely fair if you if you want to do this and and, and you want to to sell out to 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 make some money I mean I'm I'm, I'm really uh, supportive of that 
Um, the thing is only um, if you just if you build a feature for for somebody else, right? Um, and you and you think about your lifespan. Um, do you really want to build just a feature for somebody? Or do do you want to build something that is really solving a big problem, mm -hmm. like really do solving a big problem? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is, in, at least in my mind, that is really the representation of going public. Uh, if you go public, you have solved a big problem, and you have like the, the justification to be a, a company that is public and and, and just being. The company, right? I, for the lack of a better word, it's kind of um, when you think about public companies in in in, in here in uh, in Switzerland, um, like ABB, right? It's they are a world leader in a field, and and that's why they are not a, a takeover target or something like that. Exactly. And so yeah, it it would be amazing to see more kind of product companies going through the whole cycle and, and going and going public yeah. and um, yeah that would be would be cool for the for the Swiss ecosystem I agree and I think that's a perfect point to end the conversation before we wrap up we have a few rapid-fire questions for you so I either give you a selection or a short question and you have to basically say why you make the choice or you gave the answer in one sentence are you ready I have to answer in one yeah. sentence exactly okay Sailing or a session at Autumn Fit? Sailing. Yeah, still? Now I'm surprised. Why, why is that? I mean, it goes back into the strength to enjoy life. True. Because I want to do strength training only really short and brief and then go out of the studio and enjoy my life. And sailing is by definition something I want to spend many hours doing. Yes. Yeah. Enjoying life. And whatever that means for, for anybody else can be hiking or stuff like that. Nice. Always choose the thing that you want to do. Very nice. Talking about hours, how many hours of sleep did you get last night? Eight. Perfect. Workout first thing in the morning or at the end of a long day? Uh, in the middle of the morning, 10, okay. 10 to 10.30. What did you eat for breakfast today? Uh, black coffee. Nice. You also said you're a big fan of the public stock market, so you have any favorite investment? A favorite investment that's always uh, that's uh, the favorite investment I have is something I never have to sell okay so kind of I'm, I'm uh, extremely uh, seasoned by, uh, by, uh, by 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 public figures like Warren Buffett and, and, and stuff like that um, but um, actually there was kind of also a mind shift um, when when you when you go about entrepreneurship right because it's not about making money and, and that's what the, like the, the, uh, the stock price is like. If I said, buy this now and I can sell it tomorrow and make money. Yeah. It's not about making money. It's about uh, providing value. And if you, if you have an ownership stake in a company and, and the, the value they provide is still congruent with your, with your uh, uh, way of looking at the world mm -hmm. and it's growing and it's not a, a financial disaster to own this company, why would you sell it? Right, yeah, true. and um, yeah, um, but but at the moment, uh, a favorite investment of mine. If you want to have a a, a real uh, look into it, it's Splunk. Uh, I was kind of uh, Splunk uh, is is co was competitor of of, of Dynatrace, and so okay. um, they they went now through a transition, and they are really like uh, transitioning to a cloud uh, model and a subscription based model and mm -hmm. and the market is kind of making a lot of drama around it because like of accounting standards and these are the situations I love to look at it's 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 nice. a really intellectually stimulating for me to analyze the situation and see yeah. hey, that the underlying business is perfectly fine and it's just market drama True. and yeah. so they can you you can read in the financial news about it and this analyst <laughs> downgraded and, and and stuff like that and yeah, I've bought into that recently, and then you know, now I'm checking it every day. Of, like, like, what's the drama? I and then I, I'm, at one point, I'm going to forget it, uh, sure. like in two or three weeks, and then yeah. I like to set it and forget it, and then yeah, look back in a few years. Look back in a few years, yeah. And the last one for you today: Do you have a favorite autumn exercise? Yes, uh, that would be the the torso extension, like the the lower back, the lower back one. And also with the new machine, right? It's True. it's crazy. It's yeah. fe it feels like a it feels like a deadlift. 
yeah. but like <laughs> holy moly like <laughs> a, a really hard deadlift absolutely Julian thank you so much for spending the time here with us it was a pleasure talking to you and learning more about the Aram journey the fascinating and impressive Aram journey and we wish you all the best lots of success and hopefully we're going to see that IPO in a few years down the road that would be amazing take care all the best <laughs> <laughs>